Jippo is the first British film to be made under the stylistic rules of Dogma 95, the austere collective of mainly European filmmakers who swore a vow of cinematic chastity. The heroine of Jippo is Helen, played with power and sincerity by Pauline McLean, who will, I fear, always be remembered as Mrs Doyle in the TV sitcom Father Ted. Helen is a middle-aged grandma who works in a menial capacity in a Margate supermarket and spends the rest of her unleisured leisure time catering to the baby of her feckless unmarried daughter. When she's not doing that, she's coping with her surly, uncommunicative husband, Paul, played by Paul McGann. As the story unfolds from three different angles, Helen finds a kind of redemption through friendship with a beautiful young Romany Czech immigrant called Tasha. Here's a clip from early on when husband Paul comes home to find Tasha in his kitchen. So now it's a refugee camp, yeah? Oh, for God's sake, Paul, you can't say things like that in front of people. Don't turn the television on. We have a guest. It's so rude. What do you think of my drawing? What? It's good, isn't it? What? My drawing from my class. Did you do that? That's sad. That is so sad. Pauline McLean as Helen and Paul McGann as husband Paul in Jippo, directed and written by Jan Dunn. Paul McGann made his name in Bruce Robinson's cult comedy With Nail and I, in which he played the I opposite Richard E. Grant's With Nail, and since that film came out 20 years ago, has had many appearances, both on TV, including Doctor Who, The Monocled Mutineer and Hornblur, and big screen appearances, including Alien 3 and Empire of the Sun. In Jippo, he plays a bigot and a racist who spends most of the film being vile to his wife. So was Paul McGann able to find any redeeming features in him? Do you think characters need to be redeemed or have redeeming features? That's a strange one, I don't know. He's, um, I was going to say he's misunderstood, but that's probably not accurate. He's very miserable, he's depressed, we know that. But I think what's interesting about the picture is that you, as it develops... It reveals it itself in such a way, you know, from, from these three different perspectives, it's the same story, if you like, mm. told from... Yes, from it from sort of the Akira Kurosawa's Exactly right, and, style, um, yeah, and uh, so as it, as it progresses, you know, you, I hope anyway that, you know, you see, if not excuses for his demeanour and his, his actions, at least reasons, you know, you see that he's just very sad. He's sad and he's lost and he's stuck. But, in a way, he is a villain of the piece. And uh, he's a sort of a racist bigot. He exploits immigrant labour. He uses prostitutes. I mean, he's, um, he's a white van man. He, I mean, it's mm. cliché on cliché, but I think he has that kind of easy bigotry. That stupid... Well, it's a, by definition, I guess it's, it's pretty much all stupid, but it's unlearned, it's inexperienced. We're well aware that this is p perhaps the first time that he's ever met or been forced to meet his bête noire or people that he might be bigoted and prejudiced about. And I play this little Englander, you know, quite deliberately, of course. So you work in a job? Yes. I work as waitress. What about your dad? What does he do? My father is in Czech Republic. Is your mum? She here? Yes. She got a job? Yes. One for the day, one for the night. It's like this country. It's done as a refugee camp. Dad, she is a guest for dinner. Don't speak to her like that. This is like the, the, the smallest country. Dad, England's like shut the island. up. It's like the size of this table. There's too many mouths to feed as it is. This film was shot in accordance with the dogma vow of chastity, so-called, which imposes certain restrictions on the director. What were they, as far as you could see? For the director, and thereby for the actors. You shoot with available light. There's no, there are no sparks, no, no lights, no electricians. So therefore, there are no turnarounds. You're not waiting for setups. Nothing is set up. You shoot, you get what you can. You're not even allowed to dress a set. These are just a few of the, uh, there's, a, there's a list as long as my arm, I tell you. Mm. And they were, uh, they were having to check and they, they might send somebody round. It's like, you know, like health and safety or, you know, some government office. They'll send someone round, you know, without warning to just check that you're doing it. Sort of thing. You get what you can, you shoot what you can. Everything's handheld. There are no legs on the camera. So what, what you see immediately that this isn't filmmaking, mainstream filmmaking as we know it. For yeah. example, we, you know, we shot in a house. The family house was a family house. We took the keys off a family at eight in the morning. They went to work, the kids went to school. We didn't dress anything. We used their furniture, we used their kettle, their cups, their telly, everything. 
we even ate their food that was in the fridge. You're not allowed to take anything in. <laughs> I know, I know you're, it sounds ludicrous, doesn't it? But this is, this is the vow of chastity. You even, strictly speaking, are wearing your own clothes. So how much of it was improvised? I mean, how much of a script was there? There's an outline, there's a story outline, there's a few suggestions for characters. It's fairly prescriptive and strict. I don't know if they're not having us on, really, but <laughs> even, even having, having uh, undergone the experience, I'm not sure how much of it is they're just taking the pee. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but, but what was curious and what I was, I was also curious about was some of the claims made for this process. Some mm. of them a little bit extravagant. What, which ones do you Well, only, uh, you know, I mean, generally in that it's possible, for example, to make something more authentic. Well, of course, that's in the eye of the beholder, as I see it. All filmmaking, as I see it, is artifice, hmm. you know, to various degrees, this included. If I move this camera around and shake it a little bit, does that make, does that make the thing more exciting and thereby more authentic or something? Hmm. Now, I also want to ask you about With Nail and I, which is coming out in its 20th anniversary. This is going to make you feel really old. 20th anniversary edition. Dates me, mate. Next month. And to me, it's one of the great pictures of student poverty. Um, do you have fond memories of it? Of shooting it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I think if you talk to most actors, you say, well, you know, what was, when were you happiest? You know, what was the best thing you did? Most of them would say the first thing I did. Mm. A, because it was, it was a buzz. You know, you were finally doing... Mm. You were in a movie. We were mm. in a movie. You'd reached the promised land. It was, this is what you wanted to do when you were a kid. You were in this movie. And it was very happy. We were happy doing it. We knew it was good. No. If you look at the dialogue on the page, it's completely different from most films, isn't it? It's quite surreal. It is, and it's perfectly scripted as well. There's none. Mm. I mean, it's, it's the absolute opposite to something like Jippo. I mean, every nuance, every... Yeah. People don't often realise that about With Nail. It was scored like a musical score. Mm. I'm not a writer. I've never been a writer. But if you look at the example of With Nail, you know, character delineation and characterization and... You know, if you put a piece of paper over the left-hand margin, you would still know who was speaking. Mm. I know that sounds so simple, but, you, but I can't tell you the amount of times I've worked on stuff down the years where dialogue is interchangeable. But with now, it was, it was true and it was right and it was simple. If you're going to make pictures, if you're going to write scripts and try and make pictures, it ain't a bad example to have, to take, to use, because uh, it worked. Paul McGann.